CEO of Project Assistance. Gus founded Project Assistance in 1996 to transform our client's approach to portfolio and project management to achieve a standard of excellence in execution that consistently delivers expected project outcomes. Gus is a portfolio and project management expert. He's a published author of many popular articles and books on the subject of project management, including contributions to several editions of Macmillan's popular cute book series, Special Edition Using Microsoft Project. He's also the author of the project management content in the third edition of Expediting Drug and Bio Biologics Development, and has been a pre presenter at several national meetings of the Drug Information Association. Gus? Thank you, Jan, and good afternoon, everybody. Well, the first thing I'd like to cover, well, first I'd like to thank you all for being here today. Uh, the first thing I'll cover is going to be today's agenda. For those of you who might have attended, the first time we delivered this was about 15 months ago. This is a slightly upgraded version, but if you attended our first Evolve or Die webinar uh, last April, this will be uh, somewhat of a repeat for you. The agenda for today is we're first going to cover some evolution concepts and talk and, and relate that and compare and contrast that to how portfolio and project management concepts are used. We'll then talk about how organizations deliberately avoid extinction, talk about the concept of innovation, transfer that into some common pitfalls in the use of portfolio and project management, move over uh, directly off of the pitfalls are how we drive organizational changes necessary to embrace an evolve or die mentality within an organization, discuss some next steps after the webinar, and then we'll open it up for question and answers. And as Jan suggested, uh, the, uh, your phones are in mute mode, and uh, we'll process questions and answers at the end. First thing we want to talk about are some evolution concepts. And in 1859, Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species. And, he, and, and in, in this hypothesis that's now considered a theory, uh, Darwin said the following, that organisms vary, uh, experience variations or random mutations that directly impact the ability of an organism to survive in a given environment. In other words, uh, at the time, in 1859, Darwin did not even know about the existence of DNA or genes or, or uh, any of those things related to how uh, traits are passed on from uh, the parents to, to the children. But what he, what he did understand was the natural selection was a process in which favorable variations occur and, and, and then become more common in successive generations. So in other words, Darwin understood that traits are passed on from parents to children and that sometimes those traits change through variations or mutations and that sometimes those mutations are, are favorable. He also understood that unfavorable variations become less common. So, for example, an organization less than suited to the environment is less likely to survive and less likely to reproduce. So the example I typically use at this point is to discuss uh, a typical wild bunny rabbit that might have brown fur. At some point in history, uh, a, a, a fur color gene mutated and produced white fur in a bunny rabbit, and when those offsprings uh, reached the fall in the winter time, they became more likely to survive as snow fell to the ground and as the brown rabbits were contrasted against the white snow and as the white rabbits were more difficult to see, the brown rabbits became more likely to become dinner for the, for the predators that were in the environment. So this uh, third bullet here says organisms less suited to the environment are less likely to survive and less likely to reproduce, while organisms more suited to the environment are more likely to survive and more likely to reproduce. The organisms that survive were most likely to leave their variations or inheritable traits to future generations. So what that means is that in, you know, in, in the concept of evolution, change occurs randomly. Change occurs without a directed end state in mind. Change occurs by having uh, the things that are favorable in those changes surviving to the next generations and those that are not favorable not survive. So the question is, how does that relate to, to, to things like businesses, to organizations? to up and running entities that, that use project and portfolio management. How, how do these organizations deliberately avoid extinction and, and have their, if you will, traits survive into the next generation? And really, we are in a position right now where the need to change has never been any greater. 
there are companies in today's recession who are experiencing pressure to change. Some are responding well, some are not. We don't know who the winners and losers are yet, but what we do know is that we'll be looking back and reading Harvard Business Review a year or two from now and reading about these, these, these changes that occurred in organizations, people that adapted to their external environment, people that understood that while having brown fur used to be a good idea, that now we better figure out a way to have white fur if we want to survive this cold winter that's coming up. And so what this graphic really represents is if you look at uh, uh, some of the points on the graph where we see a dip, most notably between the green and the orange, we see the, the boundary between the Cretaceous and the Tertiary period, which occurred about 65 million years ago. And what that dip was, uh, represents is a mass extinction that occurred when a meteor hit the Earth and the dinosaur species were wiped out almost entirely. Other than sharks and crocodiles and a couple of other examples, there was a mass extinction. So this 2009 question mark really raises the question of, are we in a time right now where mass extinctions are occurring? And clearly, you know, if you read the newspapers or if you talk to your local bank, or as we did this year, talking to our accountant, how many less customers they have, how many companies no longer exist because of their inability to adapt to what's been happening in the economy for the last 12 to 18 months. So turbulent times require a rapid response to drastic changes. So what does that mean? How do we avoid extinction? What, what's, what's the parallel here? And, and the concept, again, from Darwin's standpoint, is that organisms survive based on the randomness of natural laws. Portfolio and project management uses something close to what uh, the creationists would call uh, intelligent design. Right, so, so Darwin's theory of evolution says that, uh, that there's not really an end state in mind, that, that you know, human beings didn't become human beings because there was some end state design that said humans should become humans. Uh, you know, we had plants turn into to bacteria at some point that became multi-celled organisms that developed eyes that became reptiles that turned into birds and mammals that became apes and monkeys. And at some point through many, many, many millions of years and many, many, many millions or billions of random mutations produce human beings. Portfolio Project Management says quite the contrary, that, that when we have an, a company reach a certain state, it happens because there is a directed series of changes or a directed series of mutations, if you will, that occur that are based on business principles, that are based on things like the mission of the organization, which we'll get to in a minute. So again, we have this idea in Darwinian evolution of random mutations and in intelligent design, while sometimes randomness occurs, while sometimes serendipity happens, uh, here in Delaware at the DuPont Company, the story is that somebody threw a, a bad batch of chemicals into the trash can and noticed that when they threw uh, other things on top of it, that nothing would stick to it, and that's how Teflon came to be. But typically, they're not the kinds of mutations that we see. We typically see a directed move towards innovation, a, a, a very purposeful step in the direction of opening new markets and bringing new products out. So we're trying to eliminate the randomness. We're trying to plan for change. Uh, in Darwinian evolution, I mentioned there's not a specific end state. And unfavorable mutations do not survive to the next generation. In intelligent design, what we're really talking about is adjusting to the business environment. As a matter of fact, for those of you involved in projects, we've all seen projects that should not have survived to the next generation that did. OK, so where natural laws don't come into, a, come into effect in Darwinian evolution, really what I would call unnatural laws are at play in portfolio and project management. An unnatural law, for example, would be that while an initiative is not aligned with the corporate uh, goals of the organization, because it's a pet project, because there's a senior executive who's using what we might call expert judgment, has decided that this project continue, we sometimes see bad projects survive forward longer than they should have. But again, the parallel evolution, we see strategies evolving in a business environment. We see projects getting spawned and in, in, a, in a sophisticated, mature portfolio and project management environment, we see the bad projects are in fact killed. So the framework we would use for what I would describe as this intelligent design really operates off of, at the very top of the organization, the mission, which, which is based on a set of values. And that mission of values transforms into some kind of a vision. That vision is then taken to a strategy, which then is taken to execution. Or if we look into just a little bit more detail about what we mean here, 
if we look at, again, what the overall mission or purpose is, the question is, why does the organization exist? It's there for a reason. What is that purpose? From that standpoint, we can take the values, which are what's important to us as an organization. What are the basic values that we have in terms of how we service our customers, how we treat our employees, how we view innovations in the marketplace, and ultimately how that translates into a vision of what, we, what do we want to be? And, how's that, and ultimately, what do we need to change to, to, to get there? So at the end of the day, as we, as we start moving closer to portfolio and project management, as we go from the purpose to the vision to the values, at some point we get to this idea of a strategy, which I like to describe as a plan for change. So whereas the brown bunny rabbit didn't necessarily plan on a gamma ray hitting its DNA and causing it to produce white furred offspring, in the, port, in, in, the, in the portfolio and project management environment, we have a deliberate thought that we're going to change. And typically we'll see these strategies cast in something like a shareholder's report or a statement from the, the senior executive team, or the, uh, team or, or the CEO of an organization that says, here's the kinds of changes we're going to make next year. So that ultimately when we make these statements about what kind of changes we're going to make, we see, we see this question about how we're going to now implement those changes. So at the end of the day, we see portfolio management really being used to say, here's what the strategy is, or here's what those, here's, here's what those initiatives are going to be. And ultimately, then the projects are the execution of how we're going to implement the plan. Let's look at some examples. So if we say a strategy is a plan for change, or is really a roadmap for the evolution of an organization, let's think about what are some examples of a plan for change? What might we, what might we find in a strategy? What are those statements? that we would see in a shareholder's report that ultimately drive the contents of a project portfolio. So we see statements like increase of sales. So, so this idea that, that we as human beings have a tendency to resist change is diametrically opposed to the goals of an organization that says, well, we're, we don't want to be static. Our shareholders, if, we publicly, if we're publicly held, don't allow us to be static. If we want to create value, if we want to create create uh, long-standing value to our shareholders, that we are in fact required to change, and, and typically we're thinking about positive changes, like how do we increase revenue or sales? What other kinds of changes might we see? How are we going to meet profit expect expectations? So not only are we going to increase sales, but we're going to do that in such a way that our sales are greater than our expenses. So we have some profit, some excess cash flow, some ability to survive. Just like the white fur protects us from the fox looking for us in the snow if we're a bunny rabbit, we have profit that protects us from downturns in the economy, such as some of the survival we're seeing right now in today's economy are the ability of some organizations to preserve cash and to cut costs and therefore to meet profit projections. Acquiring new customers, a, a variation of increasing sales, that, that if we've achieved a certain amount of presence or a certain amount of market share, we might need to acquire new customers potentially in different markets. We might need to innovate our product offerings. Every, just like an organization grows and matures and eventually dies, products go through that same evolutionary path. And so as, as our products mature and eventually sunset, or if you're in the case of a pharmaceutical company, as, as that patent expires, as that protected product becomes a generic, and we see a $4 billion product become a $400,000 product or a $4 million product, we start to look at how we can innovate and come out with new ways to to continue to increase sales, meet profit projections, and acquire new customers. Hire and retain top talent. That may be a change for an organization depending on how it's doing today. Expanding into new markets. So opening new markets, bringing new products, all of these things at the end of the day, if we make these statements as an organization that this is what our vision is, if this is our strategy for change, the question is, well, how do we do this? You know, to, to innovate our product offerings, there's projects that have to be kicked off. To acquire new customers, there's projects. To expand into new markets, there's projects. So we see this linkage between the deliberate step forward of an organization to fill its mission and strategy being embodied in the contents of a project portfolio, which ultimately are choosing the best option for changing the organization to achieve the most positive change possible. So the recipe for organizational change, or if you will, the intelligent design 
behind this, the directed end state, which is what intelligent design is about. Intelligent design says that human beings came about because there was some universal intelligent design in the universe that said, well, human beings will be the end state of the evolution of dinosaurs to mammals to monkeys to apes to human beings. So if we can use that intelligent design uh, concept, which, by the way, Darwin directly was opposed to, um, we see the portfolio management, in fact, is very different than the concept of Darwinian evolution. It's all about saying we're going to a place on purpose. So we have this idea of we can't maintain the status quo. We've got pressure to change and improve. Some of the examples I just used, the profit, the sales, the market share. So change is ongoing. It's not periodic. This idea that organizational change uh, is, is going to happen means that organizations must react to change in an ongoing way. They can't do this right now in many cases. In today's environment, what we saw at the beginning of this year, I'll use information technology organizations for an example. What we saw happening was last summer and into the early fall, the, the portfolios of IT projects were being designed and built based on a budgeting process. And in many organizations, was not very nimble not very flexible, not very uh, uh, responsive to pressure for change in a rapid fashion. So we go through a six-month cycle of bringing in ideas, getting those ideas approved, getting a budget in place. Along comes January, and if you, and if you recall what was happening between October and January of last year in the stock market, in businesses responding to drops in sales, we had, a, we had a disaster on our hands in January. So what we saw was uh, basically uh, we heard of the, the idea of frozen credit markets. We saw frozen IT budgets. We saw uh, frozen headcounts and hiring. So what we and so, so the reason this second bullet uh, in, in, in this second section is here says organizations must react to change. They can't do this right now is primarily because of not having a strong approach to portfolio management, not using that science of portfolio management effectively in such a way that response to change can be rapid and timely. So that if a meteor hits the earth and if all the green plants are going to be gone in five days, then hopefully we're more like the little mammals under the rocks and in the trees that we're able to respond to change, not the 65-ton dinosaurs that need to eat you know, a ton of, of green low foliage every day. So how do we adapt to ongoing change? Well, ultimately, we define a, a future state and a strategy, a general plan for change. We developed that strategy of supporting tactical initiatives. These become the projects, often reviewed once a year within a budget process that really should be ongoing. And, and really, more and more these days, not only do we need to be able to rapidly swirl the mix of what's in the portfolio, but we also need to be in an environment where it's no longer acceptable to have projects fail. There's more and more pressure to get it right the first time. This, this corporate culture we've seen many times where there's 35 projects in the portfolio, and only 25 to 30 of them actually get done. Five get put on hold, and five get extended into next year. We're seeing less and less tolerance with, from organizations, from senior management, to allow that to happen. So there's really significant pressure, not only for organizations to change, but really to say, how does an organization change to adopt portfolio and project management? That's one of the, that's one of the first changes we need to really think about. So when we think about this process of, of bringing in ideas and, and executing against those ideas, there's really a, a process universe, if you will. This pro project portfolio and life cycle management is three dimensions I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about. And the first or the top of the pyramid is this portfolio management, uh, the, 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 the very uh, spearhead of strategy, says that there's a way that we have to think about how we propose ideas how we compare them to one another and select those ideas, how we measure the, 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 how those ideas are, are progressing through the execution process, and ultimately how we respond when things are or are not going according to plan. So we have this idea from a process standpoint of there being strategy and governance over this, this group of projects, this portfolio. When we get to the execution layer, there's really, if, you know, if, if we were to ask the question, what does a successful project look like? The generic answer we could give is a successful project will be delivered on time, on budget, on spec. And there's really two disciplines I'd like to mention here. The first, or the bottom left-hand discipline, 
is the idea of being delivering on spec what we call life cycle management, the methodology, if you will, for delivering the outputs of the project. So if we're dealing with a, a drug development project, there's a methodology for that. In the United States, we talk about the FDA phases, preclinical, we have phase two, phase three, post-launch phase four, that's a methodology, how we do those things. Or if we talked about the letters SDLC, or software development life cycle, how we, how we develop software is a life cycle methodology. How we build uh, or construct buildings is a methodology. How we install infrastructure network hardware is a methodology. So the left-hand side is really what we would call the contents of, of, of a project plan the tasks that need to be executed to produce the outputs. The bottom right-hand side with project management are really the business controls. What are those things I'm doing as a project manager to control the business of the project? Because if we think about it, delivering to schedule and delivering to budget is really managing a small business. How do we make sure things are delivered on time? And how do we make sure that it's delivered within the cost specified? Or if not, how do we manage the scope or change the scope in order to fix it? So that's the basic process universe. So successful organizations, to, to loop back to uh, the concept we talked about, is really, from a portfolio standpoint, to deliberately avoid extinction, we have this idea of strategy and governance, or the understanding of the current state, understanding our external environment, uh, hopefully knowing that winter is coming soon, and that there may be an advantage to white fur over brown fur. But if I'm, if I, if I'm a heating oil company, that we understand that you know the products that we sell are going to sell more between the fall and the spring than they are between the spring and the fall, at least in the northern hemisphere. So understanding our environment is extremely important because ultimately that gives us clarity of our vision and mission. Right? Our future state needs to have situational awareness of what's going on both inside and outside of the organization. The business strategy or the plan for change or adaption to the external environment the project portfolio or the specific initiatives required to implement this strategy. So that's the simple breakdown. And I'll get into a little bit more detail in the next slide about what this science of portfolio management looks like. From an execution standpoint, projects are managed for health against universal rules. There should be return on investment. There should be on time, on budget, on spec. But not only that, when we think about from a portfolio standpoint, measuring the success of my projects, we typically get into more than on time, on budget, on spec. Not only should it, should, it, should it operate as designed, but it should be done in a way that is, uh, has a competitive advantage or is not risky or does not have a degree of difficulty that's beyond the core capabilities of the organization or that has an internal rate of return from a business standpoint that makes this product worth producing. So we start to see an awful lot of metrics or health indicators that say, is this project worth doing? Initially, is it worth approving? And then as that project unfolds, should it continue to happen? So all the unhealthy projects don't survive. While they may have been conceived against a set of principles or a set of metrics that seemed like it was a good idea, as that project uh, unfolds, we may find over a two- or three-year development cycle that market conditions change, that, that unknown risks uh, become known and make the project less viable, that the investment required in order to bring this product to marketplace may not be viable because costs have increased, because inputs have changed, because the commodities, the metals that are being used to produce these, these materials are no longer going to be available at the price that they were initially envisioned. So should the unhealthy projects survive, oftentimes organizations that have an unhealthy portfolio process allow unhealthy projects to survive. So we have survival of the unfit as well as survival of the fit. So successful projects lead to successful adaptation change for the organization. Bad projects drag the, drag the organization down, make them uncompetitive, have un, unnecessary costs, and drive profit down. So the result of, of successful portfolio and project management is, is really successful ev evolution. Not only does the organization evolve and survive, but ultimately and ideally it thrives. So when we think about portfolio management or this plan for change, Really, portfolio, the science of portfolio management or project portfolio management, we're not talking about investment management like in the stock market, but a portfolio of projects that, that are the markers or the design for change, really, really is based on these six primary boxes. 
the, you know, the central collection and management of project requests. How do we bring in ideas? How do we, you know, we, we, need, we need to compare them to one another, but first we need to collect them. The idea of business case management, that if we bring in ideas, that we're going to begin to state the business case. What, what are the risks? What is the degree of difficulty for the organization? What is the internal rate of return? What's the budget? What are the resource needs? What's the schedule going to be? All those things really are, are what we would find in a business case. This is a good idea because it has acceptable risk. It has a viable future in the marketplace. The competition is not doing it. The organization is uniquely positioned to produce these kinds of products and goods. The cost is not prohibitive. The return on investment is, is significant. That if we produce this product within two years, it will provide a significant profit and value back from profit and back to the shareholders. So this idea of how we build a business case and then ultimately how we compare them to one another. The way we review and rate and evaluate because what we're typically looking at when we get the selection and approval is that there's not unlimited resources, there's not unlimited time, there's not unlimited money, and there's not unlimited people within the organization to do all the ideas that are, that are initially collected. So the challenge really is to say, what are the most effective changes we can make as an organization? The bang for the buck, the greatest return on investment. A solid portfolio uh, process will deliver the most optimal selection and the approval of the best ideas. And then this measure and response idea says that as these projects unfold, we're going to have a way to measure into the project management, if you will, into the business controls, into the on time, on budget, on spec, to say, are we doing what we need to do? And if not, do we have a process for responding? How do we respond to a project that needs more money? What happens? if the risk is no longer acceptable? What do we do if we find out the train has left the station and the bridge is out 10 miles down the tracks? That's the kinds of responses we need to get into. What's the role of the steering committees that own these projects, the stakeholders, the folks who approve the budgets, the chief financial officer, the project managers themselves, what's their responsibility? The team members, the marketing department that conceived the initial idea, the people who built the business case and said there was a return on investment, the folks that did the competitive analysis. These are all things that when a business case is first developed can change over time. A solid portfolio management process will be aware of how good an idea it was to put white fur on the bunny rabbit and whether or not the foxes are not eating the bunnies. And what are we going to do when spring rolls back around and we need to continue to adapt to, to adapt and change. And really at the end of the day, it's, it, it's about saying, did we achieve the initial benefits that, this, that, that was conceived when this initiative was first put together? If we said we were going to be able to achieve some of those ideas of increasing sales, entering new marketplaces, acquiring new customers, hiring top talent, meeting profit projections, as we built the strategy to do those things and as we conceived the initiatives and as we built the business case and said, here's why we ought to do it, is there an ability to go forward at the end of the day and analyze the benefits? of what we did within that portfolio. Did we get there? So we see an awful lot of senior managers saying, we want to do portfolio management because we want to know when we fund a project that whatever was told to us in terms of the benefits, we can in fact prove when that project is over to say we got the bang for the buck. We didn't just say, yeah, go do it. We came back at the end and say, yeah, did you do it? And ultimately now as we, as we talk about measure and respond, we're really talking about what happens within a project. How do we define the scope, which, by the way, should be connected to the how we bring projects in and build a business case. Some of that scoping exercise is going to feed a business case. How we plan and organize our projects, how we bring on the right resources, how we make sure we have the right capacity. Part of what project management will do is inform the portfolio management group as whether or not there are enough resources to make the commitments. We said that when we select our projects, we, there, we have a limited amount of resource and a limited amount of dollars. Well, it's pretty hard to know what my capacity is to deliver new projects if I don't know what's going on in my current projects. Because some of those same resources that are staffing my current projects are going to be needed for my future projects. So the planning and organization and the tracking analysis and variance is going to really be what feeds back up to the portfolio. So plan and organize, yeah, but now at some point we track and we analyze because once we plan, we want to baseline our projects. We want to capture that initial estimate. We want to grab the actuals and reprojects as we go forward. 
we want to understand where we're varying from plan so we can go ahead and manage the scope. If new, if new ideas are coming in, we have a good initial scope to find and an orderly way to manage against that scope. As issues come up, we have a way to identify those issues, communicate them, get them closed. As risks come up, we have a way to escalate those risks up into the portfolio world, up into the stakeholders, to the governance bodies that initially approved this project and want to know as the project unfolds, how's it going, that we have a way to feed that information up, that we have a way to revise the plan if we're given approval for new dollars or if we're given relief for new scope to, to, to build a new target end date, that we have a way to go back and revise the plan and ultimately to continually communicate status about how all these things are happening. And again, just like we do at the end of a, pro of a, of, of a portfolio, we want to analyze the benefits. We want to do those same things within a project. Did we meet the budget? Did we meet the timeline? Did we deliver according to spec? Can we validate that we met the specifications? Do we test? Do we look at requirements? Do we look at the design? Did we change the design? Did we go back and fix the drawings? Did we, did we, did we, we analyze the specs? Did we tell manufacturing what needs to be different in the mixture as we go forward? So that's the, sort of the details of the project and portfolio management. Uh, I mentioned uh, on this next slide, when we get down into the actual life cycle methodology, as I already mentioned, uh, as we bring in the right projects and as we then build the business controls to deliver on time on, bu on, on budget, when we really get to the on spec, we get to these examples I already mentioned of life cycle management. All right, so the contents of my project plan, the tasks that are going to be executed, come from this idea that there should be a repeatable process for how we do things like building consumer products or how we uh, develop software or how we build buildings, or how we bring drugs to the marketplace, or how we deal with building the, X, the next F-22 Raptor or in, in a federal government uh, defense acquisition or aerospace defense acquisition mode. So that ultimately what these life cycle uh, methodologies do is they produce the deliverables, the outcomes of the project. And at the end of the day, what we're really talking about when we talk about change is innovation. So let's talk about that just for a minute. Innovating is really what's behind intelligent design. Bringing, you know, bringing ideas forward is what drives innovation. Taking the best ideas and making them successful is what's done through successful project and portfolio management. And again, what we're seeing in the marketplace today is you know, we're going from a knowledge economy to, a, to, a, to an innovation economy. So there's a new corporate model that's really all about creativity. Right? We, we, in order to grow, we've got to find new ways to do things. So it's not really just about how we engineer things. It's really about, you know, yeah, we can, we, we can build something, but we first have to be creative and have an imagination, and we have to have an ability to successfully innovate, especially here in this country. When you look at the amount of outsourcing that we're doing, the amount of manufacturing we're sending overseas, the question is, okay, well, if we're sending manufacturing overseas, what are we doing here? Well, hopefully we're designing things. Hopefully we're having good ideas. We have great imagination. The, the idea of Yankee ingenuity is really that innovation engine. So what, you know, what, what's senior management saying? What we're really seeing is less than half of, of CEOs are satisfied with the financial returns on their investments in innovation. Less than half. Okay, global innovation success average across all geographies and industries was 4%. So I would ask a question. Do you really just compete on cost alone? Do you want to be a commodity? Or do you think maybe innovation might see, need some kind of a process framework shared across the organization? If we're not getting the value of the investments we're making in an innovation, if we have so, so much of these things failing that only 4% are succeeding, it's pretty obvious that we need some kind of a process framework. That if we're not doing a good job now with dealing with how we bring in new ideas, if we're not really doing this stuff for how we essentially collect and management requests, how we bring in the business case, how we review and rate and evaluate and select and approve and measure and respond, maybe we need a process framework. Maybe we don't want to be one of these organizations where less than, less than half of our CEOs think that innovation is going well and that for every 100 projects we do, four products succeed. And that, and that stat's been around for a long time. I, I know this is a, 
some recent work from uh, BCG Accenture and Gardner, but um, you know, these, these stats have been true for a very long time. Uh, and, 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 you know, the idea of success is not so much the project shouldn't fail. What innovation management does when we use portfolio management successfully, when we respond, when we measure and respond, when we have a governance structure, we cancel projects sooner. So it's not so much that the product shouldn't fail, but if it fails in phase two instead of phase four, wow, what a difference. If it fails when we're doing the prototype, instead of manufacturing a million units and having the Consumer Product Safety Commission shut us down, wow, what a difference. All right, so we can really see that, that failing faster is what portfolio management is about. We can't avoid failure, but we can discover what the successes are sooner and invest in the right initiatives. And oh, by the way, when we cancel a bad project, we now divest that money and make it available to better ideas. So that really brings us to some of the common pitfalls. Organizations do embark on these initiatives. I wouldn't be surprised that half of the audience in attendance today has been in an organization that has made some attempt to roll out some sort of a, uh, I'll say enterprise, use your defini definition of enterprise at the unit department, division level, or company level to put out project and portfolio solutions, to put out the processes, the technologies, the training, the people, the change management, the strategies to say we're going to do this stuff and we're going to do it well. So some of the common pitfalls we see when we talk about or when we look at organizations that have tried to do this look like uh, setting up a PMO but not giving it a mission and authority that's clear. So we have a project management office, but it's not very clear what that project management office is supposed to do. Or we put out a uh, process and technology for project management, but at the governance level, there's no teeth to, to, to drive the adoption. All right, so we create a dysfunctional model. We put out a memo that says you delivered training last week, do project management well or else, to a group of project managers that maybe have never had to do this before. We see an effective communication, marketing or outreach strategy behind portfolio uh, management implementation. In other words, putting out project and portfolio infrastructures, process, technology, training, and change management require a good plan for managing that change. And that, that's not only the communication, marketing, or outreach strategy, but really the top leadership itself failing to address organizational change management. Grassroots movements to bring an organization forward in project and portfolio management, I'll say do not work. I'm not going to use the word never, but I'll say I've never seen them work. And we've, we've dealt with an awful lot of organizations that have done this. Some have done it well, many have failed through some of these pitfalls. Our portfolio management methods, processes, and software tools are overly complex, poorly understood, and lack integration. So the idea of Jack and the Beanstalk, we buy the magic beans, we get that uh, portfolio management technology, and we believe that by putting in technology and turning on all the bells and whistles at once, that somehow by buying dance shoes we become, we become Fred Astaire. By buying a Cessna we become Chuck Yeager. By buying a guitar we become Eric Clapton. Right? Those things just don't happen. So we see that, that you know, just buying a Fender Stratocaster doesn't make me play like Jimmy Page. And, and, and that's really where, where we see a lot of the, the, uh, the problems, right? That, that they're overly complex, poorly understood, and lack integration. Um, again, from, a, from, a, from an annual budget cycle standpoint, how projects are selected, managed, and evaluated, um, it's not standardized. The, the business doesn't have access to it. Uh, they don't understand why their projects were or were not selected. Uh, senior management does uh, what, what they want to do through expert judgment, but maybe doesn't have some of the finer points that, that have a, uh, uh, the more fine, the fine tuning, if you will, to make sure we have better, a better selection of projects, what's called uh, uh, the, the efficient frontier. If you get into portfolio management science at all, there's something called an efficient frontier, which is the best selection of projects against the organization's uh, mission and goals and strategies. Again, technology and process overmatch the organization's people capabilities. This, uh, this example I used already of buying the F-16 without a fighter pilot or buying this Fender Stratocaster without a lead guitarist, um, you know, we really, we really need to, to, to align our technology and our processes. Um, the project management maturity model. Um, 
uh, if you're not familiar with this, uh, there's a book by Kerzer, K-E-R-Z-N-E-R. -E uh, we, we'll talk about this just briefly as we get to the end of our presentation today. Uh, but, but the idea of uh, the, the maturity level of an organization uh, trying to jump from a 1 to a 5, trying to jump from a 2 to a 5, trying to jump from a 1 to a 4. Uh, again, you know, shoving the organization in a direction that it's not ready for, really uh, represented by really poor change management. So there's some of the common pitfalls we see out there. Um, how do we avoid these pitfalls? Uh, really, the, the primary words I can say about that is, from a methodological standpoint, you know, the offerings that we have as a portfolio and project management consulting organization um, really land in these three areas. But I've got to tell you, you know, if, if you were, if you were a uh, venture capitalist analyzing our revenue streams and said, well, where does your money really come from? I would tell you it's in column two. Right, the lion's share of investment we see out there in the marketplace to do portfolio and project management better is all about making and putting in stuff, right? Grabbing technology and installing it, throwing training out there, um, uh, writing, writing processes and telling people to follow them without necessarily the right amount of emphasis in, in, in columns one and three. The idea up front of scoping and requirements you know, the, 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 the bullet I used about moving too far too fast, the uh, overmatching of tools and technologies to an organization's people capabilities, a lot of that occurs because of, of a rapid move from the current state to the future state with really out, without, without having a solid understanding of what the gap is between the current and the future state. So the current state of maturity, the future state of maturity, and how wide the gap is. So. There's a methodology for that. We call that assessment strategy and tactical planning. The idea of your assessment of your current state, your future state, what the gap is, what the strategy is to close the gap. And a tactical plan, it really has what I would call a realistic digestion plan. Not trying to jump five maturity levels, but really to be realistic about what makes sense in terms of moving forward. To step into a change management strategy in which the, tra the changes are not so drastic that they choke the capabilities of the organization to adapt and, and, and drive that change. So just like we innovate our company to adapt to its external environment, project and portfolio management science offers the ability for an organization to, to modify itself internally, to really mutate on purpose, if you will, to, 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 to make those, those changes that are going to drive successful change in the future generations. So column one is all about this, this offering we, that, that we call assessment strategy and tactical planning. It really, at the end of the day, puts a boundary around requirements. It says before we do the stuff in column two, before we design something, develop it, install it, configure it, implement it, train and roll it out, that we're going to really have um, a realistic view of what those requirements are. To really tap the brakes, if you will. To do a logical progression, to say we're going to do scope management well before we do risk management well to say we're going to do schedule management well before we do labor and cost management well. Really those, those, those logical progressions that, that, that we help our customers step through to provide a realistic shot at what happens in column two. Now column three is about if I do one and two right, what have I done to make it stick? What is the execution, adoption, and governance strategy that says if we're going to deliver on time, on budget, on spec, how do we drive some level of governance that says, you know what, just like project management's a process, the way we govern the adoption to change, the way we govern how we put in portfolio and project management is a process. That there is a process for integrating technology and, and project process. There is a way to, 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 to bring that training in a, in a way that, that acknowledges how it fits for this organization at its level of maturity. For how we drive coaching and mentoring to, to, to help the people process and technology come together. For how we have an adoption process where we audit active projects and we look in and, and see where the trouble spots are and if, the, and if the process isn't being followed, we do something about it. For how we report and measure and respond to those projects and what the escalation is. So that when we have a project in trouble, that there is a way to intervene and provide corrective action. That's a process. How do we score projects? What do we do about bad projects? How do we cancel them? What are the governing bodies that get involved? At what point do we send red flags out to the stakeholders? All these things are really governance processes that need to be defined. So, so just to sort of re summarize what, what I'm talking about here, 
a lot of great energy is put into column two, putting in portfolio management process technology and training with, with, with not enough emphasis, at least in our experience, on what's the roadmap in column one, what's the plan, how do we temper the enthusiasm of overdoing the requirements so we can implement something realistic in column two and then have a governance process in column three that drives the change. So that's those, those, these first 26 slides are really about, again, how we, how we think about, uh, as an organization, evolving and adapting to the external change. So from a next step standpoint, what I'd like to spend a minute doing before I open the floor for questions and answers is, is to mention um, that if, you know, if there's any interest in what I talked about in column one, from a next step standpoint, certainly you're welcome uh, to contact us to help you determine the requirements for a successful portfolio and project management improvement in your organization and to really focus on those areas that where we see typically the greatest amount of pain, you know, project management reporting or, or the sense and response or measure and response, uh, the technology environment that may have already been invested in, that people in the, in the organization are already blaming technology, saying it doesn't work. I can tell you it does if column one and three does, is, is, is done properly. So if you've got project server, Microsoft Project Server or Microsoft Portfolio Server and it's not working for you, um, if there's a way to make it work. Uh, resource planning methods, that's a big one. I mean, the promise of portfolio management technology typically comes together. The real benefits come together when we see the tie between capacity projections or modeling uh, against demands and how we balance those things so that we can really have confidence as, as we improve our portfolio of projects going forward that we can, in fact, meet the commitments we've made from a, from a resourcing standpoint. And again, the overall governance. And so, so we have a complimentary uh, improvement and readiness briefing we can do, uh, a simple half-day initial uh, analysis uh, where we deploy our, our methodology to improve your portfolio and project management capabilities, a thorough review of your organization's current and future state, um, a roadmap to develop uh, the scope and justification it says we got to change, here's why, to address the common portfolio and project management challenges we see out there where there's a ill-conceived technology deployment that's already had a harmful effect. It said, hey, we spend a lot of money on this. This is not something we want to do. Or the common training and competency development shortcomings or the methodologies and guidance that go behind those things. So if any of those are of interest to you, uh, please contact us. There's contact information on the screen. Um, there will be uh, this webinar itself, if, if you know uh, folks in your organization that would like to review it, if there's somebody that, that should have heard this that didn't hear it, uh, there will be a, a recording uh, of today's presentation available on our website at the address that's just, uh, just shown to you. Jen just uh, showed me her cross fingers. Uh, if, if we can capture the recording, uh, today's will be there. Um, if today's is not there, we still have the one from, from last April. Uh, that we'll be missing some of the some of the uh, innovations we put in in the last year. Uh, so that's that's where we're at in terms of next steps. Um, in terms of our value prop, uh, you might have you might have gathered from some of the initial uh, things I said about our experience that we in fact uh, have a mission of making the world a better place for project management by transforming our clients' approach to portfolio and project management. Okay, so we're really looking to help our customers achieve a standard of excellence and execution so that we, you, you, do, you consistently deliver on your outcomes. Well, why is there resistance to doing this? Why does your management not want to spend money on this? Well, it's really all about can we reduce risk? Doing portfolio and project management requires taking on a risky endeavor, requires showing some progress. That while it may take a long time for your organization to change, we've got to show some initial return on investment that there has to be uh, a realization of value sooner rather than later, and ultimately that we have to drive effective organizational change. So spending the money effectively, reducing the risk, just like any other project, this needs to be treated like a project. So our practice areas are as follows. Uh, we do project and portfolio management, uh, which is what, what we talked about today in the three columns. Uh, we do deal with Microsoft SharePoint from a collaborative standpoint as a technology platform. Uh, education and competency development around portfolio and project management as well as the technologies that support that. Uh, custom application development for the integration of these types of solutions. Uh, we can certainly outsource project management uh, technologies. We can outsource the support of those technologies uh, through project management outsourcing. 
Uh, we actually run projects too. So if you need project managers in your organization, uh, we are very effective at that practice. And then also a, an add-on product for Microsoft Project called Project Commander that streamlines going from the Gantt chart to the resource management side of the house. So at this point in the presentation, what I'd like to do is to open up the floor for, a, for a questions and answers. And I think what I'm going to do is turn this over to Jan. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So uh, Jan Goodman was going to rejoin us. And Jan, if you could uh, please uh, monitor the question and answer console. And as these questions in, come in, I'll do my best to answer them. OK, Gus, we've already received two questions. So I'll start with the first one. OK. I'm an IT project manager. Does this information really apply to IT projects? And if so, how? OK, thanks. Uh, thanks for submitting that question. I, uh, maybe I was uh, used too many examples of product innovation when I talked about uh, uh, you know generating revenue and increasing sales, but clearly uh, you know IT portfolio or port project management. What I call that sometimes is uh, cost center project management. So so when we're doing product management, uh, for new product development, what we're doing uh, uh, professional services management, like we do, delivering projects for a price with to generate revenue. Uh, well, IT project management is different in terms of the fact that it's, uh, it's viewed more as a cost to the organization and less often, not all the time, but less often uh, viewed as something that generates revenue. Clearly, IT project management can have a cost, uh, can have an effect both on, on the cost of the organization by more efficiently delivering IT services to the organization, number one, and number two, by also uh, more effectively managing the, uh, the cost of those projects so that if we do commit to 35 projects, we deliver on 35 projects. So the fast answer is yes, this organization does really apply to IT projects. And how it applies is uh, typically we'll see a, a, a less emphasis on managing the cost of people only because IT organizations oftentimes the people cost, at least for the internal IT folks, is viewed as a sunk cost and oftentimes not as uh, closely managed. Okay, thanks, Gus. Um, the second question. In your experience, do you see organizations effectively use project and portfolio technologies as a driver for change? And can you give some examples? Uh, yes, we have. And what we've seen is um, really the, the <laughs> it's an interesting question from the standpoint that this whole discussion we have about evolution, uh, part of the reason for us using that metaphor is not only is evolution about adapting to change, but evolution is also sometimes about doing things in a gradual fashion. So what we have seen out there is uh, that using project and portfolio, and I see the word technologies here, not, not science. So uh, I think the question is really, in using project and portfolio technology, can that be used to drive change? Yes and no. I've seen it both done effectively and ineffectively. I've seen it done ineffectively when uh, I used the, uh, the magic beans analysis that you know we think by buying technology, uh, we're going to get better at it. And, and, and the analogy I use there is buying the guitar doesn't make you Eric Clapton, buying a, a Cessna doesn't make you Chuck Yeager. Um, that, that it can be a mistake to think that portfolio, the portfolio and project management technologies will drive change. But what I have seen the reverse of that is, is that when it's recognized, um, and I'll just, just briefly, let me see if I can remember what slide this was. Uh, going back to, I guess it's slide 26. This idea for how we drive change in having an effective strategy on the front end and a successful project governance framework on the back end, what we have seen is when I get to column two, that in fact bringing that technology in to get installed and configured and implemented and trained, in fact, will effectively drive change. You want to read the next one, Jen? Sure. Um, how can finance and portfolio management future look like? What does a finance and portfolio management future look like? How can we see that in the same bucket? Let me just reread the question. How can finance and portfolio management, I, I maybe it means, uh, what does the port finance and portfolio management future look like? How can we see that in the same bucket? That's a good question. I, I presume we're talking about, when we talk about finance portfolio management, that, we would think about something like our uh, our personal investment portfolio, our retirement plan, if you will, or if you're a uh, uh, a, uh, a portfolio manager for portfolio manager for BlackRock Investments on Wall Street, 
uh, if you really think about it, they are extremely similar uh, in terms of the fact that what we're talking about is effectively managing the investment in, 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 uh, in a group of ideas, if you will. Uh, the finance portfolio management is more like the, the, the funds, if you will, the individual investments that we make or the uh, uh, portfolio of investments in terms of a mutual fund. And uh, in portfolio management from a project standpoint really tries to mimic that. It really tries to ride the coattails of investment portfolio management that says that, you know, we, have to man we have to pick the right investments, monitor those investments, get rid of bad ones, and make good ones. So where uh, I, probably the biggest difference is, uh, especially if you're on Wall Street, those, those, those decisions are made on a stopwatch, if you will. Uh, in, in the corporate world, we sometimes see uh, almost the exact opposite, where uh, things need to move faster. You know, uh, proj bad projects are allowed to continue, and um, and uh, maybe a little bit more like maybe what some of us uh, wish we had done with our retirement funds last fall. That if we, if we like fund managers on Wall Street had managed like a stopwatch, then when we, as soon as we saw our portfolio dip two percent, five percent, ten percent, we would have we would have uh, exited and divested of those investments. Really, portfolio management is all about making the right investments. No more questions? OK, well, it's a good thing, because I think your clock just struck 401. Uh, let me see. So if I go back to page two, slide 33. Uh, that is the conclusion of our questions and answers for today. So all I have to say at this point is uh, I thank you for attending. And we look forward to seeing you in a future webinar. You can also find a list of those on our website. Thank you.